You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Freedom is all about choices. And while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xe, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War episode 169. Last episode, we discussed the beginning of the attack at Amiens that was launched by the Allied forces on August 8th. On that day, the attack had managed to advance as much as 10 miles into German territory, throwing the German army into a bit of chaos. Ludendorff would call it the Black Day of the German army. We start our episode today on the evening of that day, August 8th. The Allies would have to determine how best to carry forward their attack and how best to capitalize on their previous success. We will cover the continuation of the attack in Amiens all the way until its conclusion. After the attack was halted around Amiens, the Allies would then broaden the front of their attack, both to the north and to the south, and they would launch attacks to try and take advantage of their victory. Along the way, there will be some things to discuss about the German situation, because things were really starting to get interesting on that side of the line, and not interesting in a good way. After the start of the offensive at Amiens, the headline for the New York Times would read, Haig breaks foe's line on 25-mile front, gains 7 miles, takes 10,000 men 100 guns, German manpower visibly on the wane. This was not a totally inaccurate assessment of the situation on August 8th. It was clear that the British were on to something, and so they started to plan for August 9th. By midday on the 8th, Haig had been to visit Rawlinson, and he would later recount what he had told the 4th Army's commander about the plan to move forward. I told Rawlinson to continue to work on the orders already given, namely to organize his left strongly. If opportunity offers to advance it to the line of Albert Bray, uh, with his left strongly held, he should push his defensive front out to the line of Chalm to Roy, Reconnaissance should be pushed forward to the Somme River, while his main effort is directed southwest towards Wa to help the French. The cavalry should work on the outer flank of the infantry and move towards Shawl to Ra as soon as possible. Orders would eventually be sent out to the divisions to accomplish these tasks, although there was a bit of a delay. Afterwards, Rawlinson's chief of staff would try to explain why there was this delay in the issuance of the orders. It's a reason that I find a bit humorous. He would say, quote, what actually happened was that everyone was so busy congratulating everyone else on their share of the victory that valuable time was lost in preparing for an advance the next day. Now, the orders did eventually get sent out, and they mostly just represented what Haig had spoken to Rawlinson about. They would require an advance of about five and a half miles. Uh, the advances would, have, would be the largest by the Canadians, as opposed to the eighth where the Australians had the furthest to go. The path that the orders took to get down to the individual units was pretty standard, but the timing that they would arrive was important. In the evening of the 8th, the divisional commanders would meet with their corps commanders, and the general outline for the plan was communicated. Then, over the next several hours, the more detailed planning occurred, which meant that detailed orders did not get issued to some Canadian divisions until as late as 5.30 in the morning. This meant that the attack could not be launched at dawn like the British liked to do. There was an attempt to prepare the units for what was coming, with them being told earlier that they would be advancing down the amiens Wa road. But without more detailed information, nothing could really happen. A similar situation was happening for the Australians. The plan for the Australians was similar to what had been done the day before, with the 1st and 5th Divisions leading and then the 2nd passing through the 1st to continue forward. 
orders would still not arrive until the early morning, and even then, they contained the extra complication of needing to wait for the Canadians to begin, and then also having some ambiguity on their final objectives, since it was dependent on how the Canadians' attack developed. While orders went out to the infantry, they also went out to the cavalry corps, which would be moved closer to the front. Rawlinson had two cavalry divisions at his disposal, with the 1st Cavalry Division working with the Australians and the 2nd Division working with the Canadians. It was hoped that these units and their mobility might prove useful in the coming attacks. To the south of the British, the French also planned to continue their advance, and once again their primary goal was to protect the right flank of the British troops. While the Allies were trying to figure out how to push things forward, the Germans were not idle. Things had went very poorly for them on the first day of the attack, but that did not mean that they were ready to throw in the towel. On the night between the 8th and the 9th, six additional divisions had been moved into the front around Amiens. Half would be positioned against the British and half against the French. This meant that while the Allies still had the numerical advantage in manpower, their overall advantage would be much smaller than it had been the day before. The delay in getting orders to the frontline units and to the artillery meant that the attack resumed very late the next day. To make matters even worse, since there had been no plan for these movements when the attack began on the 8th, it proved very difficult to coordinate the various units. Along the entire front of the attack, there would be countless different start times, with all the units going forward at slightly different moments. Some of them would begin as early as late morning, and then they would just sort of string out along most of the day. That did not mean that the attacks were all failures. There were many successes. For example, on the right side of the British front, they attacked around 4 p.m., and they were able to advance about 5 kilometers, which was a good, solid amount, but far less than what was hoped for. The French in the south also made good progress. In all of these cases, the advances continued, but the disorganization of the Allied attacks and the German responses with reserve units moving into the area kept the advance from achieving the same successes that it had on the first day of the offensive. While all the planning for August 9th had been rushed and had occurred too late, the same mistake was not made for the 10th. Again, the Australians would be going forward, but they received orders in time to start at 4 a.m., one problem that the Allies were starting to experience, and something that they could not really resolve, was troop exhaustion. Because the same units were being used for the attacks day after day, they were not able to fully be relieved. Here is one soldier from the Australian 25th Battalion who would be writing about the situation late on August 9th. Quote, we are feeling exhausted, annoyed, and rebellious, for we have had practically no sleep since the night of the 7th, and have had very little food or water, and hard, continuous fatigues. It would only need a determined leader, and quite a number would, without permission, leave the line and return to some spot where they could get some rest behind the line. To put it shortly, the men in the units that were at the front since the 7th were very tired. They had spent the previous days attacking, defending, and then preparing to attack again. These same levels of exhaustion were happening for the Germans as well, but they were bringing in reserves. Now, the situation was slightly better on the Canadian sector of the front, with the arrival of the British 32nd Division. These fresher troops would be joined by the Canadian 3rd Division in an attack on the 10th. The attack was planned to begin at 8 a.m., but there was a serious danger of missing the deadline, because the 32nd Division was not informed of the plan until after 9 p.m. on the 9th. It took every bit of organization muscle that the staff officers of the 32nd Division and the Canadian Corps possessed to get it into place and ready for 8 a.m. Even with this effort to get the infantry in place, the attack still did not begin because the tanks that were supposed to assist the 32nd Division had not arrived. It would be two hours before the tanks were ready and the attack would begin, and again it would push the front forward, just like the previous days. On the 11th, the situation would be much the same, with orders being issued late on the 10th for an attack to continue. While the troops continued pushing forward, as would often happen during the day, the commanders got together behind the front to discuss what would happen next. In this case, Rawlinson, Debenet, and all of the high-level commanders would meet with Haig, who would arrive after they were all together. In The Day We Won the War, Turning Point at Amiens, 8th August 1918, Charles Messenger describes the crazy events that happened next. Quote, no sooner had General Monash's subordinate commanders gathered around 
Then Sir Henry Wilson arrived, followed by Haig, who gave the assembled Australian audience a complimentary speech, praising Monash in particular. And then came Rawlinson, followed by his other corps commanders, as well as Hugh Ells of the Tank Corps and Lionel Charton of the commander of the 8th Brigade RAF. Haig insisted that Rawlinson's conference not be delayed, and he began by asking the view of the Army Corps commanders on the present situation, but the flood of visitors had not ended. A short while later, another three cars arrived with French Prime Minister George Clemenceau, his finance minister, and Ferdinand Foch on board. Monash recalled, of course, there was no thought of serious work or discussion for some 20 minutes, while everyone was being presented to everyone else. I was personally, naturally, with General Curie, the leading figure in the show, for everybody was highly complimentary and marveled at the completeness of our success. End quote. This is exactly what I would have expected to happen in a situation like this, especially in the midst of a bit of an allied success. Just basically not a whole lot of serious business, lots of congratulations, lots of people showing up. The overall conclusion of this meeting would be that the offensive would should be paused after the attacks on the 11th. The troops needed to rest for at least a little bit, but then it would hopefully resume on the 14th or 15th. There were many reasons that the offensive was put on hiatus for a few days. One of these was that behind the Allied front there was just a mass of confusion with troops, supplies, and artillery trying to move forward, back, and sideways all at the same time. The artillery was also becoming increasingly out of position since it could not keep up with the advance of the infantry as it continued forward. Both of these combined to make it seem like the German defenses were stiffening. The Germans were certainly doing a better job at defending by this stage in the offensive, but the weakening of the Allied offensive abilities was just as important as the Germans becoming stronger on the defense. There was also a bit of a geography problem. That good old Sum battlefield is once again coming back into our story. The Germans had pushed back across it during the spring offensives, but now the Allies were coming back into it the other way. In that territory, it would be difficult for the tanks and supplies to move forward, which was the same problem that the Germans had experienced and the same problem that the French would soon experience to the south. In the four days of fighting at Amiens, the Germans had suffered somewhere around 75,000 casualties. Maybe a few less than that, numbers seem to vary a bit. Of these, about 50,000 had been taken prisoner by the Allies, which was a pretty large percentage. Most of these prisoners were not taken on the first day, when the situation was worst for the Germans, but instead in the following days, when theoretically the, the defense should have been more capable. Crown Prince Ruprecht wanted to continue to pull his troops back, but there was some resistance from Ludendorff and others at German high command. Colonel Losberg, the leading German defensive theorist, again suggested that the German troops should be pulled back to the Hindenburg Line, or the Siegfried Line, as it was called at the time, but again, we're referring to it as the Hindenburg Line here. There would be many discussions about these suggestions, but before anything was decided, there was an attempt to determine what had caused the defeat at Amiens in the first place, which was an important step because it would uh, drive later decisions. The first reason identified for the cause of the defeat was that the troops were surprised by the usage of tanks on such a mass scale. The second was that there had been very little in terms of defensive positions in which the troops could be placed. And the third was that the available artillery had been completely inadequate for the task. Now, only one of these problems could really be solved by retreating to the Hindenburg Line. The others were just a matter of proper preparation. This was not enough to convince Ludendorff that a retreat was necessary, but we should probably talk about Ludendorff for a moment. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, 
Even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. It's pretty much from this date, until he resigns in October, that Ludendorff gets the greatest amount of criticism for his actions. I made a big deal last episode about him calling August 8th the Black Day of the German Army, but that was just a piece of his reaction, and really probably the calmest part of it. To put it bluntly, he would sort of panic during the four days of Amiens. One example of this is that he would constantly telephone senior officers, including Ruprecht's headquarters. The crown prince would direct these calls to his chief of staff, and he would later recall that he was impressed with his chief of staff because he, quote, remained unruffled by the continual telephone calls from Ludendorff, who wanted to plan every move of the newly arrived battalions of the Alpine Corps, and he just appeased Ludendorff by answering with a yes, or by saying to him, we cannot yet predict how things will turn out. Everything needs to depend on the situation as it develops. Constantly bothering his leaders did nothing to help the situation, and on August 8th, Ludendorff offered Hindenburg his resignation, which was of course rejected. At the same time that he was basically panicking, he also refused to allow for a retreat like Lossberg was suggesting, and this vacillation between despair and faith in eventual victory would be a common piece of Ludendorff's leadership for the rest of the war. In late August, a physician would examine the German quartermaster general, and he would report that Ludendorff was on the verge of a nervous breakdown due to overwork and exhaustion. He also reported that it was possible that the general was on the edge of no longer being able to function properly. After the Allies had stopped attacking at Amiens, the military and political leadership of Germany met in Spa, Belgium. During this meeting, Hindenburg would say that the situation was certainly serious, but that it must not be forgotten that we were still standing deep in enemy territory. Here again, Ludendorff would have seemingly two different opinions about the situation. On one hand, he would report that, quote, I reviewed the military situation, the condition of the army, the position of our allies, and explained that it is no longer possible to force the enemy to sue for peace by an offensive. That seems like a pretty good assessment of the situation. But when Hindenburg then suggested that maybe they should consider retreating to the Hindenburg line, Ludendorff again refused, stating that it would be disastrous to give up so much territory voluntarily. There was also political representatives at this meeting, and one of them was the German Secretary of State, Paul von Hintz, who had replaced Beth van Holweg. He would say that, quote, the logical conclusion that peace negotiations were essential, and that we should have to bring ourselves to take up a conciliatory attitude. All of the military leadership refused this idea, knowing that if negotiations started after a huge Allied victory, the peace terms would be very harsh. The only real outcome of these meetings was that Hintz was allowed to try and reach out to the Allies through the Queen of the Netherlands to see if peace might be an option. I know that it's been quite a while since we discussed the events on the Italian front, but a brief reminder of what had happened on that front over the course of the summer of 1918 is probably warranted. The Germans had pressed the Austrians to launch an attack against the Italians during the spring and summer, and eventually this had happened. It was led by our old friend Konrad von Hotzendorf, and while he was no longer overall commander of the Austrian armies, he was now a field commander, and he commanded the troops on the river Piave. When the attack occurred, it was a huge failure, and the Italians, with some help from the British and French, hit back really hard. This attack essentially made the Austro-Hungarian army a dead man walking. When this was combined with the very problematic situation in the Balkans that we will discuss in a few episodes, it forced the German calculations about the war to change. 
Germany's allies were at the end of their ability to continue the fight, and that just put more pressure on Germany and the German troops on the Western Front to do something that would give a good opportunity to begin negotiations. The Allies, on the other hand, were determined to not let this happen, and the process of pushing forward more attacks began even while Amiens was still underway. Foch was looking to expand the Allied efforts because he was afraid that if the pressure was lifted off, even for a moment, the Germans would do exactly what the Germans were already discussing, retreat to the Hindenburg Line. If the Germans were able to do what they had done in early 1917, which was pull back along a wide front into the positions of the Hindenburg Line, then they would be able to shorten their lines, move more troops into reserve, and maybe delay the end of the war. Because of these concerns, Foch wanted the Amiens attack to continue, and for attacks to begin in other places as well. He found almost universal resistance to this idea. In the Amiens sector, all of the major commanders were concerned that they needed some time which would result in the pause after uh, August 11th. This decision was delivered by Haig to Foch, uh, but Haig also had another plan. Instead of continuing the attack at Amiens where the Germans had rushed in reinforcements, he instead wanted to attack to the north with the Third Army. This represented a big shift for Allied strategy when compared to previous years. The best summary would simply be that the British and French were now trying to attack where the Germans were not, instead of spending months attacking the same spot where they already were. This new policy resulted in attacks to the north and the south of Amiens, and renewed French efforts south at the Marne. On August 21st, the British would attack in what would be called the Battle of Albert. This attack would be launched by the Third Army under the command of General Bing. Here the British would attack in the early morning, much like at Amiens, and there would be no evidence presented to the Germans that an attack was about to be launched, and instead the troops for the attack were moved up only on the night before, and the artillery did not fire any long pre-attack bombardment. The result of the attack would be an advance of three miles. Not a success like Amiens, but good, solid, very real progress. A few days later they would attack again, and again more progress would be made, including the capture of an important railway. With the attacks by the Third Army successful, the British attacks began or were continued along the entire area of their responsibility. This included attacks in Arras, the attacks near the Old Somme uh, landmarks of Beaumont Hamel and Thiepval. Many of these efforts were led by the Canadians and Australians once again, and every time they attacked it seemed like it always ended in success and their stocks rose even higher and Haig wanted to use them more. For the British Army this period was important. All of these attacks were still hard work, and they, they would be costly in terms of casualties. But at the same time, there was a definitive feeling that what the British were doing was actually working now. The emphasis on accurate and powerful artillery on small unit tactics and proper usage of fire and movement, all of them were starting to work. This was critical for an army that had, in reality, known very little but failure during three long years of war. In one of these attacks would be a British Private Turner, whose quote I include here because I think it does a good job of describing a feeling that I've used many other quotes to try and describe, and this is what it was like to be near artillery fire that was happening along the front. He would say, quote, One writes of the thunder of gunfire, but in reality, it's not like that at all. My mother once asked me what it was like, and I answered that if you stood on the platform of any railway junction as an express train roared through, and multiplied the sound by about 20 times, you would have a fairly good idea of what a barrage was like." End quote. On the 20th, the French would attack between Soissons and Campagne, and they would advance 12 kilometers in two days. During this time, they would capture 30,000 German prisoners and the city of Noyon. Here, they would find themselves in a very problematic situation, the same one that the British were also experiencing, but instead of the old Somme battlefield being the problem, it was instead the destroyed strip of land that the Germans had abandoned in their retreat to the Hindenburg Line in early 1917. One French staff officer would describe it like this, quote, full of shell holes, all houses destroyed, ruins, nothing but ruins, in the midst of which the steel skeletons of the refineries stretched their great bare arms up towards the sky. While these problems slowed the French advance, they still pushed forward. By the end of August, they continued their drive north from Soissons and Noyon, and they would make it almost to the River Somme. 
During these attacks, the French suffered 100,000 casualties, but Foch believed that the sacrifice was worth it, saying that, quote, the enemy had lost all the gains he had made in the spring. He had lost heavily in men, munitions, and stores. Most important of all, he had lost the initiative of operations. He had lost his moral ascendancy. Even Patan would be kind of optimistic about the situation, stating that the French army had, quote, won the most complete success along its entire front, overran the whole of the center of resistance, which for a long time the enemy had been powerfully fortifying. Even though the Allies had were having some success, Foch continued to dream bigger, and he hoped that the next set of attacks could be placed from the English Channel all the way to the River Meuse. For these attacks, the most important objective was the critical rail junction of Mezier, which would be the responsibility of the Americans. We will discuss the beginning of those attacks next episode. All that the German army could do against these continual hammer blows was to fend them off as best as they could, and also to retreat. More retreats were ordered. This included a move into what was called the Winter Position on the Somme Sector, but these positions would not live up to their names. During August, the German army had suffered 228,000 casualties, and they had only received 130,000 replacements. So in a month, they were 100,000 short on reinforcements, and this shortage was forced and felt by units that were already weakened by a year of activity. Lossberg would note that many German divisions would soon have to be broken up and their men sent to other units, much like the British and French had had to do in early 1918. More important than that straight number was that many officers began officially reporting in August and September that the cohesion and fortitude of their troops was failing. Part of the problem was that the reserves continued to dwindle in numbers, and so those troops that were brought out of the line had to be kept closer so that they could rush to the front when needed. This kept them near the guns and limited the amount of rest that they could actually get, which just increased the amount of strain and fatigue that everyone was already feeling. This also left them well within range of Allied air attacks, which were becoming a constant nuisance, especially as units tried to move around. On September 2nd, the fateful step was taken to order the 17th Army to retreat to the Hindenburg Line, which other armies would follow the, over the coming days. This was it, the Hindenburg Line. But there was a problem. The defenses were not as formidable as they had once been. Most of the construction of these fortifications had been done over two years in the past, and they desperately needed attention. They had also been designed to defend against an enemy that was using very different tactics when compared with the Allies of 1918. The German defenders were also just not as physically capable, and this meant that there were many German leaders who believed that the line could not be held long. This would prove to be true, because before all of the German troops could even retreat to the defensive line, it was already breached in the north by the Canadians, who broke through at drocourt crian a sector of the defenses to the far north. It had taken just five days of attacking to make it through, and twice the amount of artillery that was used at Amiens, but they had broken through the line. At German headquarters, discussions began about creating a new line of defenses that would be well behind the Hindenburg positions to be referred to as the Hermann Line. Already, the Hindenburg Line was proving to not quite be the impregnable set of defenses that the Germans hoped that it was, and if it could be breached, what then? It was truly the beginning of the end. I hope you will join me next episode as we shift our focus south to the American attack at St. Mihail and then their effort at the Meuse-Argonne.